Okay, this is a, um, going to be an introduction to the spherical harmonics, and we're going to introduce those by solving a Dirichlet problem. That's a boundary value uh, problem with uh, Laplace's equation. We're going to assume that we're working with the interior of the sphere, but we could just as easily be working with Laplace's equation on the exterior of the sphere. And uh, in spherical coordinates, just to introduce my notation, uh, we have a radial coordinate, uh, we have a um, we have a theta coordinate that measures distance from my north pole, which is going to be the z-axis. Uh, we have um, a phi, a, a phi um, variable, which uh, is the longitudinal coordinate uh, that measures rotation in the x, y, and plane. Uh, so the Laplace's equation, of course, involves the Laplacian, and uh, that is that is uh, has this radial part, uh, the theta part, and the phi part. Uh, you can get this by plugging in those h1, h2, h3 scale factors, uh, or just remember this one because it comes up all the time. And so this is equal to zero, and that's what makes it Laplace's equation. Uh, okay, so um, a student asked uh, this uh, excellent question, and that is, why do we expect separation of variables to work for solving this problem? Uh, the boundary condition in this problem, you can see here, uh, is not a homogeneous boundary condition. And one of the conditions for separation of variables to work was that we had to have homogeneous boundary conditions. Well, it's a good question. Um, the surface of the sphere is actually naturally periodic. And so the, the way we're going to use separation of variables is going to be now to separate the R dependence from the theta and phi dependence. And the theta and phi variables are sort of naturally periodic. It might seem that that uh, theta is not periodic, but remember that we could have picked the North Pole to be anywhere on the sphere, and so really all directions have this natural built-in periodicity. Um, so it's because of that uh, that we get this um, these eigenfunctions, the spherical harmonics, at the end of the day, uh, out of um, out of this uh, uh, solution that I'm going to show today. Okay, so so note that we'll find eigenfunctions for the theta and phi dependence, but not for the r dependence in this problem. r will be much like uh, the t uh, equals zero initial condition uh, that we used in solving, um, say, the, uh, uh, the heat equation in earlier parts of the class. Okay, so with that aside, um, what we're going to do now is to, um, is to uh, guess a solution of this form. It will be uh, that u of r theta and phi is a function of r times a function of theta times a function of phi, the usual uh, separation of variables approach. Uh, we're going to divide by r theta phi uh, dependence and uh, also by this r to the minus 2. And what that does is it separates this into, into three terms. We have an r-dependent term, we have a theta-dependent term, and we have a term that depends on theta and phi. So we can now separate the r-dependence from the other two pieces. Uh, we introduce a separation constant, which is suggestively written here with the symbol lambda, uh, because it will become the eigenvalue later in this problem. So, uh, so we have one equation uh, for r, and we have another equation for the theta and the phi. First, what we're going to do is go through and solve the R equation. This is an equidimensional equation. We can convert that into an equation with constant coefficients uh, by just going through and making the substitution R equals e to the t. And uh, t now has nothing to do with time, of course. It's just standing in, holding a place uh, in this problem for the time being. The new equation in t uh, becomes this. Uh, that is an equation with constant coefficients. Now we guess an exponential solution. We recover this equation for the roots of uh, the roots L in that problem. So we have L squared plus L minus lambda, and that should be equal to zero. Of course, the exponential part is not zero. Uh, so my roots, uh, I have two roots, L plus or minus, and those are given by uh, this expression here in terms of the value lambda in the original problem. Now, it's, it's sort of useful uh, at this point to note that if I add the two, the two roots together, I get minus one. And if I multiply these two roots together, I get minus lambda. Okay, so what I'm going to do is write lambda plus in terms of lambda minus by using this equation. And then note uh, that I can go on and write that lambda must then be equal to L minus times 1 plus L minus. So what I'm going to do uh, from this point forward is drop the distinction L plus and minus and keep track of these by just keeping track of the value of L minus, which we're just going to call L. Okay, so, um, so L now is going to just be called um, L minus will just become L in all of our uh, solution from here, here on. And we'll remember that the other root in the R equation was minus 1 plus L. 
Okay, so now we have two equations to this ex two solutions to this exponential or sorry equidimensional equation. That is uh, a r to the l and b r to the minus l plus one. Uh, so I want to note here at this point that we do not yet know that l is an integer. Some of you may have already seen some of these things in quantum mechanics or pchem class uh, along the way, and uh, know that l is going to turn out to be the integer angular momentum. Um, but uh, we are we are not going to assume that just yet. Uh, so, uh, so thus far, we have a solution that looks to be of this form. I have an R dependence and an unknown theta and phi dependence. Uh, but that theta phi dependence must uh, satisfy this equation where we know that the lambda now is L times 1 plus L. Okay, so this is now the uh, equation for the theta and phi variables. What we're going to do now is to go through and multiply by sine squared of theta. And now this equation becomes separable. I can now break the uh, the phi dependence into this piece and the theta dependence into this piece with this new separation constant m squared. Okay, so that gives us uh, a phi equation that is, uh, that is just the usual uh, harmonic oscillator equation and uh, it's going to give us phi of phi uh, is C1 uh, cosine m phi and a sine m phi term as well. Okay, so the theta equation is a bit more difficult uh, that is uh, the associated Legendre's equation. Um, well, it's not really quite yet the associated Legendre's equation. What we have to do first is to borrow a leap of insight um, uh, from some, uh, I guess, Legendre, and uh, substitute that t is equal to cosine of theta in this equation. Uh, what that ends up giving us then is, uh, is this uh, set of substitutions, uh, note sine squared, uh, is equal to 1 minus cosine squared, so which we can then just write as 1 minus t squared. That's useful because, of course, there are sine squared terms in this equation. And uh, we can now go through and write this whole equation in terms of the new variable t. Uh, this t has nothing to do with the t that we used in solving the r-dependent equation. Again, it's just a variable filling in uh, for cosine of theta here. t is equal to cosine of theta. Okay, so, um, so this is associated Legendre's equation. And uh, it is a self-adjoint equation. You can go through and show that. Actually, this uh, can be written in sturm liouville form, uh, as, as was true also for the r and the, and the phi equations. But remember that r was not periodic, and the boundary condition at r equals 1 was not homogeneous. And so, um, so you know, we're sort of treating phi and theta differently uh, because of that. Uh, OK, so, so it's um, rather tedious but straightforward uh, to show that if p l of t solves this Legendre's equation. Remember, we solved Legendre's equation by, uh, by a power series method earlier in the class, and uh, we found that it solves this equation. Uh, so if this is true, then we know that, uh, that it, taking m derivatives of, of this uh, Legendre polynomial and multiplying those m derivatives, nth derivatives, by uh, 1 minus t squared to the, uh, to the power m over 2 uh, gives you a solution to the associated Legendre's equation. Uh, so we won't go through that. Um, I used to go through that, but I think it's a lot of detail and that the students uh, get lost at this point in the class and it's, um, it's uh, more important to know, uh, you know how to construct these solutions, I guess. Uh, okay, so, um, so what we're going to do now is uh, to remember that when we solved Legendre's equation, we required uh, this, this uh, parameter L in the equation to be an integer. And that was because that was the only way to obtain solutions that would converge all the way out to an argument of 1, right? And we want solutions that converge at t equals 1 because that is the north pole of our spherical geometry and also minus 1 is the north pole, is the south pole of our spherical geometry, if you will. So this is how we got a series solution that terminated and so we have to have integer values of L, specifically going from 0, 1, 2 on out to infinity. Uh, and, and in addition to that, we have this other parameter m uh, and we can only differentiate this l -th order Legendre polynomial m times before it's going to vanish. And therefore, we have to require that m be equal to 0, 1, 2, etc. on out to l, right? It can't be l plus 1. Uh, so, so the solutions of these associated Legendre polynomials are p0, uh, 0, uh, which is just 1, uh, p1, 0, the 0 is implied here, uh, which is just t, and p2, 0. Uh, which is which is this uh, uh, quadratic polynomial, and then uh, after we differentiate that, multiply by the one factors of one minus t squared to the one half, uh, the p one one uh, Legendre uh, associated Legendre uh, function is is this 
P21 is this, P20 is this, and you can go on and build this infinite triangle of these things. And, um, and that's, uh, I think, as much as we will do in that direction. Okay, so the associated Legendre's equation also has a solution QLM. That solution, though, is singular at t equals plus or minus 1, which corresponds to the location pi, or theta equals 0 and pi in our solutions. And so we rarely use these QLM functions, and we won't talk about them more here. Okay, so um, what we have thus far is that uh, we have an R dependence, that is uh, this R to the L and R to the minus L plus 1. Uh, we have a theta LM dependence. On, on theta, uh, and that is uh, the associated Legendre functions uh, with arguments that are cosine of theta, and we threw away these because we said they were unbounded and not, and not useful uh, for our purposes. Um, so uh, we also have the, the phi dependence, which is just cosine and sine of m phi. And the limits on L and m are as given here, 0 uh, through infinity, and then m goes from 0 up to L. Okay, so um, recall that any finite Fourier series uh, summing from m equals 0 up to L uh, with cosine and sine of m phi um, can, can equally be written in this form uh, where I take e to the i m, theta, I m phi and uh, include uh, complex valued coefficients here uh, and extend my summation to minus L, right? Because this e to the i m phi is cosine plus i sine of theta. Uh, so in order to uh, describe uh, for example, real functions, I have to have the CM uh, equals the C minus M complex conjugate. Okay, so um, so these are relations that you can go through and derive. Uh, basically, the CM coefficients in this kind of expansion are related. The CM and the C minus M in this kind of expansion are related to the CM and the BM in that kind of expansion. Uh, but they are uh, both equivalent ways of representing the same function. So now we can write the solutions in this form. We have this uh, this R dependence, and we also have this theta phi dependence, which is in this in this second sum here. And for each L, uh, we're going to have a sum that goes from M minus L to L now. So M now can take on negative values. And the convention is to take everything that's over here and group it into something called a spherical harmonic. Okay, the spherical harmonic is this YLM function. It's a function of both theta and phi. It has a normalization factor sitting out here in front, and it has the associated Legendre function and the e to the i m phi. And this is this little conditional. If m is positive, uh, it's minus 1 to the m. And if m is negative, uh, the coefficient on this thing is, is uh, just a positive 1. Okay, so um, this is our normalized spherical harmonic. And we can uh, now write down solutions to our Dirichlet problem as... Uh, as um, u of r theta and phi is equal to the r dependence uh, multiplied by the spherical harmonics. So we're expanding them in these spherical harmonics with the spherical harmonics playing the role of eigenfunctions. And I think that that is, uh, is it. I want to stop this recording and...